that Allah SWT will love for him too. Tonight, inshallah, we'll be speaking about a very sensitive topic, a topic that's uh, misunderstood, a topic that's uh, misused, and that is the, con the concept of love and how it intertwines with our actions. So, firstly, the first part of the, to the talk, inshallah, we'll talk about determining the concept of love, what is love, and its different types, what types of love, love is. And the second part, inshallah, we'll talk about how love, al-hub, is the essence of our akhlaq, our manners, our morals, our ethics. So if you allow me to start, please recite Allah Salawat Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Love is the tendency or the inclination towards something. When you love someone, you are inclined to them. You have you 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 walk towards them. You have affection towards them. When you love something, you have a tendency towards this thing. That is love. That's how we're going to understand love for now. Let's now understand the different types of love. Love, inshallah, we'll understand the concept of birth. There are three different types of love. You know, we say, I love you, you love me, I love this, I love my games. I love... There are three different types. The first one is divine love, which is al hubbur rabbani the second type of love is humane love, which is al hubb al insani which is love between one another. And the third is al hubb al shahwani which is lustful love. Now, divine love is love between man and his creator, man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How much do I love Allah? The second type of love is human love, which is the love between one another, between our brothers and sisters, between man and his wife between man and his children. That's humane love. Lustful love is love that is connected to something. Something materialistic. Something to fill, fill, fulfill my needs. So, the needs that I have, whether it's uh, a, a certain game that I want to play which fulfills the, the need to have fun and to uh, be happy, that's a lustful love. So these are the three different types of love. The Holy Quran speaks about each one of them each, each, each one of these different types of love on many different occasions. For example, when it, when it talks about divine love, what does it say? Allah SWT says, and those of you who love your religion, who, uh, sorry, on those of you who leave your religion, Allah SWT will bring your people a society which He loves and they love Him. So He's talking about the kuffar, the people that, that, that leave Islam. The ones that leave Islam, He's tell, Allah SWT is telling them, there's going to be a people that are going to come and they love me and I love them. So the love between man and Allah SWT, divine love. When speaking about humane love, Allah SWT, what does he say? He says, O oh mankind, who has created you from male and free male, and made you into different tribes and different nations, so you could be acquainted with one another. So humans, because we are social beings, we can't, you can't put a man on an island pretending to live alone. We can't live like that. We can't. We are social beings. And because we are social beings, Allah SWT created us as social beings. We have to be with one another. So Allah SWT creates us in different tribes, in different colors, in different skin colors, from different places, different ethnicity, ethnicities. So why? Why is what, What's the cause? What's the reason? Is so we can get to know one another. Getting to know one another to eventually become in love with one another. And once again, the term, when I use the term love, I want you to forget the term that you that you watch in movies. This romantic love that we see in movies, we're gonna forget that for a second and thinking about think about these three different types. So because we are social, we tend to love one another on a social level. So love between man and man, man and woman. So man and his children, his brother and his sister, and his wife, etc. And then you have lust for love. Allah SWT, what does he say in the Holy Quran? He says, and it has been decorated for man, the love for desire and for pleasure. So this love that I have towards this specific thing that makes me happy, for example, when it comes to wrong doings and you get happy with 
you know, fulfilling your shahwa, your desire in a sinful way. These are temporary, Allah SWT said they're temporary happiness. They're decorated. I am decorating this for you. I'm going to let you, I'm going to deceive you and make you feel like this is love. You're going to think that this is, this is happiness, but this is not happiness. There's going to come a time where you're going to think, oh, what was that? What was that action? So, what is the philosophy behind dividing this love, this concept, into these three different categories? Why do we, why do we divide? Why do you understand love into humane, divine, and lustful love? Allah SWT, if you go back to the Holy Quran, on many occasions, He describes the human being as a breath from His Spirit. وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحٍ وَنَفَخْنَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحٍ وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحٍ so he always, he, he, the human being is a breath from the spirit of Allah subhanahu wa Not the literal breath, but the breath as in he is taking the characteristic and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa For example, when I am a kareem, when I am nice, when I am, when I am charitable, I have to remember that this, this charity that I'm giving because I'm char charitable doesn't mean I, get, I got it for myself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that's char charitable. Any single characteristic I bring and I, I attain and I think, oh, this is me, remember, the infinite level of this characteristic is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I don't want to get too deep into this, in this topic and why, but just briefly, when I say cause and effect, when I say law of causation, which is something that's, uh, that no, no, no physicist or uh, a, a, religion, a religious scholar can deny, when I say there's cause and effect, everything that exists within the cause has to exist within the effect so i can't come and say oh i'm going to squeeze an orange and then tell you oh here's water no if i squeeze the orange i'm going to get orange juice cause and effect so because allah SWT is the ultimate cause for every single human being it's the ultimate cause for all creation when i find when i find a certain characteristic that i have that i that 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 exists within me, remember that these beautiful characteristics my wife, my love, anything and anyone. This love is not infinite, infinite and it doesn't last forever. I have a friend, we, I tell him, oh, I'll die for you. He'll tell me, oh, I'll die for you too. You know, a small little fight, it's finished. A small little fight, a small little mix-up, our love or our friendship or our brotherhood is finished. You know, or for example, when we were younger, we loved playing a specific game. You fall in love with this game. As time passes, you get sick of it. Oh, I don't want to play it anymore. I'm over it. So this is lustful love. The love that you have and you, 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 you give towards the materialistic things in life. Whereas when you love Allah SWT, why does he say this is the perfect love and why this, this love is infinite and it's everlasting? Is because of this, this, this point here. Because Allah SWT is perfection. Boys, brothers and sisters, I want you to focus on this point. Allah SWT is perfection. He is infinite perfection. He is perfect in every single quality. Okay? And human beings are always searching for perfection. Whether we know it or not, whether we claim it or not, every single human being is always looking and striving towards perfection. We are always striving towards Allah, but we don't even know it. Whether you believe in Allah SWT or not, whether you believe in Al Hayy Al Qayyum, Al Rahman Al Rahim, or you don't believe in Al Hayy Al Qayyum, Al Rahman Al Rahim, Al Bazza, you're always going to be searching for it. When you begin to work, for example, when you begin to work and you start making money, you, you keep thinking, oh, how can I make more money? Or how can I work harder? Or when I'm married, for men, how can I get married to another wife, for example? Or is it even possible? You're always looking for perfection in every single thing in your life, even if it's a, even if it's a, you know, with, with toddlers, for example, when they're first born, as a baby, 
the, the, in, the instinct is, I want to learn how to crawl. And then the instinct is, I want to learn how to walk. Because walking is more perfect than crawling. And then I want to learn how to run. And then I want to learn how to you know, play. And I want to learn how to talk. Because not talking and talking aren't the same thing. Talking is more perfect than not being able to talk. Reading is more perfect than not being able to read. Running is more perfect than not being able to run. These are all little, small little, small little examples. I'm sure if you all think in every single detail of your life, you'll always be, you'll always be searching for perfection. And because Allah SWT is the ultimate perfection on every single level, we're always going to be searching for Allah SWT, whether we know it or whether we don't, we don't know it. Whether you believe in Allah SWT or whether you don't believe in Allah SWT. Whether you're going to say Allah SWT is Allah or He's Jesus or He's Moses or... or, or. Wherever, whatever you believe in, you're always going to be searching for perfection. So this love and this, this struggle towards perfection is infinite between every single man, woman, child, not child, old, young, whatever color you are, whatever religion you are, you're always going to be striving for this perfection. And therefore, it's always consistent, it's infinite, it's always there. So this love is real. So when it comes to between me and my friend, my brother, my wife, yes, I can make it infinite. How can I make my, my love towards my family infinite? How can I make it perfect? Is when I connect the love of my father, or my mother, or my wife, or my daughter, or my son, to Allah SWT. That's when this love becomes pure. That's when this love becomes perfect. Because the connection between me and this person is Allah SWT. So, in summary, we've understood that love is being inclined towards something. Str struggling towards, running towards something. And we've understood the different types of love and we said the only infinite love is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, for the second part of this talk, I'm going to try and take, make this concept of love that we spoke about more practical. And that is, firstly we understand what is akhlaq. When I say akhlaq, I mean morals, ethics, mannerisms. What are the, how do I define akhlaq? How do I define this, this action? Is it a good action? Is it considered ethical? Is it considered moral? Or is it considered otherwise? How do I know? What's, what's the line? What's the, what's the base for it? What's the definition of it? For example, I pick up this cup of water and I drink from it. Do you come and say, oh, that was an ethical action, that was morally accepted? Or do you say, no, I just, it was just a normal action, you just drank water, it was normal. Whereas when I come and say, oh, I'm going to be just towards my brother, I'm going to be patient towards my brother. This action now is different. Now you classify, oh, he's being just, he's, 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 he's implying, he's applying justice in his life, therefore he is morally or he's ethically accepted. That's an ethically accepted action. So, what is, the, what is the line? How do I measure right from wrong here? There are three mainstream opinions on this, on this course. Before we get to the Islamic opinion, and the opinion of the Ahlul Bayt, we'll speak about the three main philosophers in the West right now. Or, that they have passed, but the, the, the ideology still exists. Number one, which is from a French philosopher by the name of Descartes and he was from around the 16th century and the second is from a German philosopher his name is and many of you have probably heard Emmanuel Kant and he is from the 18th century and the third one is from a man called Sartre and he's also a French philosopher we'll understand and dissect their opinions and how they justify or how they, how they understand what akhlaq is, how morals are. And by the way, this is extremely important because we live in the West. Most of these opinions are what's implied now today in the UK or in Australia or Canada. So when a, a brother or a friend from the English community comes and he looks at your actions, this is maybe one, by judging by one of these three opinions that I'm about to mention, they say, oh, you know, that was an ethical accept, that was akhlaqi actionable. The first thing before the cut, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first theory before the cut, he says, ethics.
ethics and morals holo is the action which transcends the I, meaning any action that I do, not for myself, so I can, this, my actions can be divided into two categories. I do something for someone, or I do something for myself. Any action that is, that I do for someone else, and not for myself, so I forget it, forgotten myself, Descartes considers it as an ethical action. It's nice, it's a nice concept, it's a nice theory, but it's wrong, and why? You see, you look at, for example, the mother. Any sane mother, any sane mother, I express the word sane because we've reached insane times, unfortunately. Any sane mother that has a new, a new child, toddler, when she wants to come and nurture this child, take care of this child, breastfeed this child, she is doing what? She's doing for others. She's doing for the child. She's not doing for herself. It's got nothing to do with her. Whereas when you come and see a mother, for example, breastfeeding a child, you don't say, oh, well, she's got a nice akhlaq. No, she's, she, instinctively she's going to do that. Any sane mother, out of instinct, is going to take care of her child. She's going to nurture her child. She's going to breastfeed the child. So although this action wasn't for herself, you don't come and consider this as an ethical action. Because if she did say, oh, I don't want to nurture my child, if she said, oh, I don't want to breastfeed my child, if she said, I don't want to, I don't want to take care of my child, you won't say, oh, she's unethical. You'd say she's not human. You question her, her humanity. So there are actions, and this is just one example, where the cause of the action may be others. The reason why you do the action is for others, but it's not considered as a, it's considered instant. The second theory, which is for Manuel Kant, he says, morals are what's done and said and all said and are motivated by your conscience. Meaning what? Basically, to draw a picture, you have within you, you have like a courtyard. Inside of you, you have a courtyard. And the judge is your conscience. Whatever your conscience judges good, which is more, which equals morally accepted, or ethically accepted, or it's, it's an akhlaq action. Whatever your conscience says, uh, that means as bad, that means it's unethical, or you know, it's uh, immoral. So this is his, his, his theory. Also, it's a nice theory, it, it makes sense, and, you know, but there's a problem. So in Islam, if I see a brother, for example, as a Muslim now, I'm on the train in the UK. I say UK because I don't really know many places here. You know? I'm in, on, on the train and I see a guy, I have no connection to him, no faith, faithful connection, I don't even know his name, he's a total stranger. And I see him, and I see he, for example, he wants to he drops something on the ground for example. I can pick it up for him or I can leave it. Now, if I left it and I didn't pick it up for him, my conscience won't hurt me. He dropped his paper, he can go down, get out, go down and get it. It's, it's a normal action. Whereas if I drop down and I get this paper for him and I hand it to him, they say, oh, that was a very moral oh, action. That was a, that was, you have nice club, you have nice morals, you have nice ethics. So on, on, on the theory, under the theory of Kant, uh, he, he's, no, my conscience didn't, you know, he, he didn't tell me it's a bad action, neither did it say it's a good action. You know? So it's, it's not ethically uh, accepted or unaccepted. So yeah, that's a problem in the theory. The third theory, which is, uh, in my idea, is the funniest theory, but it's a theory at the end of the day, and unfortunately now we're in the capitalistic state. Uh, this is the most, uh, the most, I guess, understood theory, applied theory, the most practical theory, unfortunately. Which, what, what does he say? He says, Sartre, John Paul Sartre, he says, morals or a club doesn't abide by what the conscious thinks. Neither does it abide by, why, by the I, so with me doing X action for others, no, no, no. It says, akhlaq, morals, are, is, is, a, is part of a social understanding. Meaning what? 
Meaning, I don't hurt you, so you don't hurt me. I don't attack you, so you don't attack me. I don't oppress you, so you don't oppress me. This is like the concept of karma. What goes around, comes around. Right? I don't steal from you because I don't want anyone to steal from me. This is his theory. Now, unfortunately, oh, it's, it's pretty obvious that the theory is wrong. Why? Because the people that are in no need for others, for example, you have prime ministers of states or big time businessmen that don't fear anyone, that have all the money in the world, they don't care about anything. And these people don't have to abide by any social conduct, <coughs> moral conduct, or ethical conduct. Because they don't fear anyone, from steal, anyone steals from them. They don't care. No one's going to steal from them. No one can touch them. No one can hurt me. I'm a businessman. I'm a big time businessman. I'm, I'm successful. I am this. I am that. No one can come and you know, oppress me. I am the oppressor. So because he's, he's reached this level of understanding so doesn't have to believe in moral conduct or ethical conduct. Whereas in Islam, he says, no. Islam, every single person has to abide by khuluq. So now we've reached the Islamic understanding of the Islamic truth. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Rahadri ya aliyyas. Lai takbir. Allahu akbar. Ala rasalat ya rasulillah. Rahadri ya aliyyas. Islam. It's akhlaq perfectly. It says, akhlaq is hubbul jamal. Meaning, the love of beauty. The love for beauty. Every action that we do originates from our love toward beauty. And I will touch on that so it's not going to be blurry. I will explain that. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran? It says, it's not for him in an insana. لربه لكنوه وإنه على ذلك لشهيد وإنه لحب الخير لشهيد. So to the human being he says, and his love, the human being's love towards goodness, towards beauty, is deep. It's strong. Our love towards that is strong. It's the origin. And when he says خير goodness, goodness is an example of beauty. So if I love goodness, I love beauty. If my origin is goodness, my origin is beauty. And the difference between this theory now, the Islamic, the Islamic uh, belief, or the Islamic theory on Allah, it's already socially, I think, accepted. And the other three theories is, we believe in the Alam al the metaphysical world. The other three, uh, the other three theories speak about the materialistic world. Whereas akhlaq doesn't only abide by the materialistic world. So when I say jamal and beauty, I can be, and I'll explain, I'll explain how you can have love and how you can portray your akhlaq and your, your morals through your actions through Abu Abdullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam later on. To the three metaphysical world, through animal life. But firstly, what is beauty? What is Jamal? Jamal, they say, is basically consistency. When two things are consistent or are coordinated together. For example, when you see a person's face, the eyes are consistent, they're coordinated perfectly with the eyebrows and the nose, the mouth. You say, this, this face is beautiful. There's coordination between every single part of his face. <sighs> so, beauty is coordination, beauty is consistency, and it's not, it's not restri restricted to the materialistic things. Now, also to get a bit deeper and to understand how beauty is the origin for, our, uh, for, for defining our actions, we have to understand this top this concept first. We say that man has three different energies, three different energies. Al quwa al quwa al ghadabiya, al quwa al shahwiya, wal quwa al aqil. Meaning, 
القوى الغضبيه از او انرجي اوف انجر اند وي جيت ذا وانا من انا من ستيك سايد انجر ريفنج القوى الشهويه از او انرجي اوف لاست اتس اتس فيزيكال لاست كمز تو اور بوديز اور وات وي بون فيزيكال Or when it comes to you know, having fun or playing games, etc., the energy of lust. And the, the, the third core, which is the core of is the energy of rationality, rational thinking. These are different types of energies within us. For example, when it comes to the energy of anger, most of us can tend to get angry, or we can be patient. But what, what's, what are the two, two lines? Where, where do I draw the line between good anger and bad anger? I say, for example, I get a person, I get two people in front of me, I say, this person is a chicken. Meaning, he gets scared if someone comes and bullies him, if there's someone trying to oppress him, he doesn't defend himself, he doesn't stand up for himself, he's a chicken. He's a scary cat. And then you have the second type of person where this guy, you can't even speak to him one word before he slaps you on the face. You know? This is the second type. The first type is bad, which is tafrit in Arabic. We have, we, there's, there's too little of, there's no equilibrium between what I'm supposed to be. So I'm a chicken here. I had to be a chicken here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go bow down to a man like Yazid. No, I will stand up against humiliation. I will not be humiliated. So this is the first part. This guy is, is a humiliation. It's humiliating. And then the second guy is extreme. He just completely gets angry for no reason. And this is called the fraud. And this is also unacceptable. Where a person says one word to him and he gets, he gets angry and he starts to swear and he starts to go on. So, where are we? We're supposed to sit in the middle between these two. From Salah Alayhi Salaam says, I'm wrong, Bain, I'm right. We're not the fraud, we are not the fraud, we are not two, we are not angry people, and we are not human people that are chicken. We aren't, we aren't chicken, we are Shia of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So, we stand up for ourselves. So, we have to find the equilibrium, the middle line between this and that. So, when I come to my actions, what do I do? I come and see every single action of mine, every single action of mine, where's the equilibrium between too much and too little? When I see someone, for example, walking on the street, someone's walking on the street, and this guy swears at me, for example. I look now, someone's swearing at me. If I retaliate, if I retaliate to this man, am I going too far? And if I don't retaliate and I say nothing, am I going too low? I say, oh, wait a second. If I say a nice word to you, I, would, I wouldn't have humiliated myself. And I wouldn't have got angry. I would have taught him a lesson. I stand up for myself in a very smart way. And then when I, when I act in that way, when I act in that way, he says, oh, this guy, he's got my son. He's got my son. And that's why, what does Al Salah alayhi salam said when he mentions earlier? Yesterday, he says, You have to be pre preachers for us. Oh, Shia, be preachers for us. But not through your words. Through your actions. Show us that you have akhlaq. Show the people that you have akhlaq. Show the people that this, this is the akhlaq of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Another example, inshallah, I'll end with this, is, for example, when it comes to our shahya, our lust. You can have a person that does not act upon his lust whatsoever. This guy is ivory, he's a statue. And then you have a person that acts too much upon his lust. Gluttony when it comes to food, for example, instead of eating a small amount, they just, you know, get full. He completes, he continues to eat, continues to eat, continues to eat. Like Mu'awiyah, for example, he says, I eat and I eat and I eat and I don't get full. I stop eating because I'm tired. My, my, my jaws are tired of eating. Gluttony. 
of dying. So we don't want to get to that level where we don't eat whatsoever. You know? We don't want to get to that level where we become like rock. But we don't want to get to that level where we become like Muhawi. We don't want to get to the level of Muhawi. So there has to be an equilibrium. So now, and this comes, to, now I'll go, I'll go to our main topic. This is the topic of all topics in Muharram. How do we classify the actions of Allah Abdullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Say for a man, if you, you have to think about this here. A man takes his whole family, he's going to war, he takes his whole family, takes his, his sister, takes his children, takes the woman of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the children, the grandchildren of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I ask, is this action of Allah Abdullah already accepted? It's a question, someone might ask it. Is it socially accepted? Is it an akhlaqi action of Allah Abdullah? Why would you do that? Why would you take this woman? What's the reason, Allah Abdullah? Why just why not just take your companions and your friends and the people that want to fight for you? The seven two. Why go take the whole family? And it's a valid question. And we'll say the answer is the action of Allah Abdullah Salam taking his children and taking the women and taking his family was the epitome of beauty. It was the epitome of, of khuluq and akhlaq. Why? Not just because we love Allah Abdullah, not because we are like the Arabs, like we spoke about uh, a couple of months ago, where they're just firing so they're into Islam. No, no, no. When I say epitome of beauty and moral, I say, I'll tell you why. Because this man, Abdullah Salaam, when he takes, when he's talking about taking his family, there's a reason. He's put between two choices. He takes his family and he shows the world that this revolution of mine isn't about me. This revolution of mine isn't about what Hussein ibn Ali wants. This revolution isn't, isn't about power. It's not about oh, I'm going to win physically with, with the war, with, with, my, with my sword. Or else he wouldn't have took his, took his children. He's showing the world that this revolution is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uphold the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's showing the people as well. He's showing his, the, the world that, you know the Arabs, by the way, just on the sideline, the Arabs back in the day, they had this, these qualities, yeah? whether, you're, whether you're religious or not. They had loyalty, pride, was an extremely important thing for them. When it came to women, women were a logo. They had the ghira. Arabs had the ghira. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa implemented this, this characteristic in the Arabs and the Muslims, they had the ghira over the woman. So Imam Hussain alayhi salam, he tells them, when he gets to Karbala, he tells them, in lam yakun lakum deen, if you do not believe in God, if you do not believe in religion, he's telling the enemy, at least be free in this world. Has it reached a level where you come and attack a man with children? Has it reached a level where you, where you, where you, where you kill a 13 or 14 year old? Has it reached that level with you? So it's between two options. The first option, he takes his family and he shows the whole world that I lived in this oppression and I didn't come for me. I came for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, what the, 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 the equilibrium here is my, what I want is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what they want is for me to fall. What they want is for me to fail. What the enemy wants is for me to die. And I'll die. And not only will I die, I'll take my children so they can die. And not only them, I'll take my companions so they can die. And not only them, I'll take my, 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 my woman so I can show the world that it's not about me. Or 
why you could have done this. You could have run alone. So his companions. War is finished. Okay, well done. Done. He had the option, but he didn't take it. Because he's showing the world what I want is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And that is the epitome of khuluq. That is the epitome of conduct, ethical conduct. When I come, and if, when we're able, brothers and sisters, to come and say, oh, I was between two situations, and I chose what Allah wanted, no, when, he, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something, like we said before, Allah wants beauty for it. Allah wants perfection. So, he chooses to sacrifice, he chooses to sacrifice his family, and it's perfectly summed up in one line. This sacrifice and this whole talk that we just spoke about is summed up in one line. One line by Sayyidina Zainab and this is the last line. Sayyidina Zainab she sees what's happened, she sees the actions of her brother, she sees how she's brought, every, he's brought all his family, she sees his, her brother now on the floor and his head is detached from his body. She sees her brothers, she sees her sons, she sees her cousins, she sees her family, she sees her friends, she sees the woman running from tent to tent, and then she looks at the sky and she says, I saw nothing but beauty. Because here, although the, the outward action, the action for us now, the same, the scenario I just put in front of us now, is a blood swords and death in the eyes of Zainab alayhi salam was beautiful because why? Because it's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted. ya Rabb, khuth hatta tawba. Oh Allah, are you happy? Are you satisfied? Keep taking. Take as much as you want. So, Yom Pusha alayhi salam, he decides to take his children and he decides to take his family. And as the Prophet ﷺ prophesies, he says, Rasulullah says, you will be killed by my son in a land by the name of Karba. And then the narrations come and say, my brothers and sisters, when the Prophet ﷺ had left Mecca and he couldn't complete his Hajj, he began to move with his companions. He reached the land. They stopped to rest. Imagine this, my brothers and sisters. Imagine you're with your Imam right now. And he tells you, let's get on the horses and continue riding. He gets on one horse, according to the narrations, and he tries to get a move, and he won't move. Gets off, gets onto the other horse. It tries to ride the horse. Move, you want move. Gets off until we've done this to seven horses. Seven horses where he tried to begin transportation and they will not move. So then he gets off the horse. And then he asks. ما اسم هذه الآن قالوا أرض الغادرية. He gets off the horses and he asks the people, what is the name of this land? They say it's called غادرية. He says, does it have another name? قالوا تسمى نينوى. They said its other name is نينوى. Its other name is Nainawah. It has another name called Shati Ul Farad. And then he says, Does it have another name? They said, he tells them, this is the land, this is the land, prepare yourselves, get off the horses, oh my family, 
This is the land where our blood will be shed. This is the land where they will take captive our women. This is the land where they will kill our men. This is the land where they will slaughter our children. This is the land where people will come to visit us in our graves. All of this in Zayn Sayyidina Zaynab alayhi salam is listening. هذا وزيانا بتسمع مقالة أخوها الحسين What does she say? هاي أخويا هي هي أرض الدفوف هاي أخويا جسمك تقطع هالسيوف هاي اخويا امن القهر من هالسما شوف او برادا ذيس از ذا لاند اوف كربلاء ذيس از ذا لاند وير ذا سوردز ويل كات يو بيت باي بيت Then Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam brings his children together. He brings his family together. He brings his cousins. He brings his companions. And he tells Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allahumma inna ahlu atrat nabiyyika Muhammad. He says, Oh Allah. This is the family of your holy prophet and look what they are about to do to his family. I say my brothers and sisters, this is the day where Sayyidina Zainab had her brothers and sisters next to her. This is the day when she had Abu Fadl Abbas on her left. She had Al Qasim. She had Abu Abdullah on her right. She had Ali Al Akbar. But no matter what, Zainab and her brothers Zainab are in the Shura. And the night of the Eleventh of the Month. But what is the God with Sayyid Zainab alayhi salam on the tenth day of Muharram, on the tenth day where she has no one next to her? What is the stance of Sayyid Zainab? حيث كانت الحورة تنادي أخي حسين where she begins to scream, "Oh my brother Hussein!" لكنها ما تسمع جوابا أخي عباس ما تسمع جوابا She screams for her brother Abbas and she still cannot hear an answer لا ترى إلا من صاف حتى راب جبينه All she can see All she can see are her brothers laid down on the graves of Karbala. Ma hal qalb zayna, ma hal qalb zayna. Wa hiya tara akhah al Hussein jutha bil aras. What do we say to Zainab alayhi salam when she is sitting down and all she can see is her brother Abba Abdullah al-Hussain, a body without a head. And all of the other martyrs on the ground on the land of Karbala. Oh, she calls out for her mother. Oh, Mother Fatima. Oh, Mother Fatima, come see what I have done to your son, Hussein. 
O oh, mother Fatima, and she replies, she says, Ya Yumma, Ya Zianab, Ana Yummich Mubaid. O oh, my daughter Zainab, I am not far away from you. Ana Shift Al Hsian, Min Hazza Warid. I saw Hussein when they were beheading him slowly. Oh, 